Welcome to MLOps Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and MLOps. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Welcome back to another episode of MLOps Live. So I'm Sabine, your host. I'm joined by my co-host, Steven. And with us today, we have Michal Tadiushak, who will be answering questions about managing computer vision projects. So Michal is the director of AI at DeepSense.ai. He has two master's degrees in complex systems, science from Ecole Polytechnique and the University of Warwick. And he has led several data science projects spanning multiple industries like manufacturing, retail, healthcare, insurance, safety, etc. Uh, also science projects around um, technologies like predictive modeling, computer vision, NLP, and several profiles like commercial, uh, proof of concepts, competitions, workshops. So it would have been much easier for me to list things that you have not done, <laughs> Michal. Welcome. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thank you for, for this introduction. So yeah, uh, probably the reason for this is that uh, I have been working uh, for almost seven years right now in a company that's doing the project for the client. So we, we don't really control the flow for of these projects who, who are going to come next with, with what kind of a challenge. And therefore, yeah, the list was <laughs> quite uh, broad, I'd say. Absolutely. So Michal, to warm you up for all this question answering, uh, how would you explain to us managing computer vision projects in one minute? Magic computer vision project is, I'd say that, uh, okay, there are some things that are related just to managing projects in, in general. Uh, and especially from my point of view, I, I, I'm busy with projects for, for external clients. So this is a major kind of like aspect. So I'd say that managing, you know, like people is the, is the most important part. So on the one side is, this is a client with, uh, where you have to manage together, like the, the goal, it has to be understood, the, the scope, the timeline, the expectations, uh, you know, these these are all very key and important aspects. And the other side is managing the team to to develop the the, the project. We'll, we'll see that there uh, the expectations, like that, the, let's say the motivation of people, uh, the feeling of the playing to one goal. So you know, team team uh, spirit. Yeah, these are probably the most important parts. All right, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Stephen. Awesome. Definitely sounds a whole like <laughs> the typical project management dilemma. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Michal. Um, I'd love to, uh, because we are focusing on computer vision right now. And just can you walk me through your typical steps for, you know, setting up a vanilla computer vision project, you know, from when you start discussing the business side of things, coming up with the business requirements of the stakeholders to actually delivering, delivering either a proof of concept or a scalable solution. Can you walk me through a concept? Yeah, so um, it doesn't, so, so the computer vision part, it's uh, usually not so kind of like relevant in the, in the first place, because uh, if you, you definitely want to start with understanding the, the goal, understanding the, kind of the business purpose of the entire corporation, uh, what, what the client's client needs. And this is, um, and this is like, it, it has, it doesn't have to be like in the beginning, like too technical the discussion. The first discussions are rather to understand the ma ma major pain points and then how, right. in general, the business the business works there. But then also to um, discuss more technical details and then depending on the like maturity of the client on the other side, how technical they are, and then uh, then you can go deeper or not into into technicalities. But like in general, the, the the first thing is to translate this business problem into technical terms, in especially you know machine learning terms, um, and then what's usually the the first thing to 
to do after defining the goal, the, the scope, is to um, see the data. What I mean is like to, to be sure that there are uh, enough data uh, and labels to address, to, to tackle uh, the task. And especially right. in computer vision projects, this is something that's, um, I'd say, quite easy uh, comparing to different um, ML projects because uh, in computer vision, you, you, once you have access to even a sample of images, this is already quite clear the you know the how difficult the problem might be while when we speak about like nlp problems or or classical ml problems with tabular data when the data can be spread in huge databases you have to do a lot of you know cleaning up merging etc this is much harder thing for computer vision this is actually quite um, an easier thing to do so once you have it uh, then the kind of like a general life cycle of developing the, the project goes on. Um, we're still the, the one of the most important aspects is that you have to be you have to work close with the to the, closely with the client uh, and you know having them in the loop, having them in the decision processes and also in the evaluation of you know this the solution kind of like why while while it evolves, why it uh, why it changes. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for that. So, can you, can you if you can, of course, uh, because I know do a lot of things that have deep sense uh, with like it's, since it's like a contracting company. But can you walk us through an example of a computer vision project where you talk to the stakeholders, you have to agree a lot of things with the clients or not, and to actually delivering uh, a workable software? Yeah, right. I could I could give you one of the examples where. Um, it was pretty, I'd say, serious project um, we've done okay. for um, okay. manufacture of tires, and the question was to, or the problem was to the quality of sh assurance of the uh, manufactured tires. And then uh, this was uh, so we, when we were first uh, asked by, by the client if we can come up with the models to detect different defects, assess the severity, the types, then uh, maybe you know also classify them into. Uh, you know the ones that are actually need inter intervention versus the ones that can just you know pass uh, and, and they're fine. We thought, of course, we can, uh, but you know there are a lot of kind of like re requirements, a lot of uh, things that has to be in place to in order to make it. Uh, because in the end, the model is obviously uh, it's kind of like this major major part the data scientists are busy with, uh, or the or the key part. But there's a lot of other things that have have to be. Uh, secured first, and it turned out that uh, this is not it's not going to be too easy because um, you know it was uh, pretty pretty preliminary uh, kind of like concept ID on their side. They didn't have the the labels. They were yet to build the entire like device to collect the data, etc. So we actually uh, were helping them shape the like end to end approach to the solution. So in the end, we not only made this, this, this the models and then I made a solution like ML solution, but we actually designed and um, developed a labeling tool for them, which was like specialized for labeling the tires with different, mm -hmm. uh, which is not just like a regular image. You have like a, okay, this is one thing is to the tire. It has, has its sector zones, which are relevant, but also uh, that the defects that we've been, that we were working with, some of them could be, Recognizing 2D images, uh, like just visual aspects, were 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 key ones, like scratches or some bubbles, etc. But there are also some that were more like deformations, quite hard to to notice, and uh, like a black piece of rubber. Uh, therefore, we also had some like 3D 3D images, uh, and uh, you know the entire solution was to combine the information from 2D, 3D. All together. Uh, so once we've done the labeling tool for them, and they've done the labeling, um, the labeling process that we helped them with, then there was the, the modeling part, which also took took some time. As uh, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, that it was the solution to quite disturb the regular workflow with with the quality assurance mm -hmm. and there were many aspects to be that were Im Im important in here what i mean is uh, mm, what to do with this what to do with uh, with the without outputs of the model you know like how to even uh, build 
<clears throat> the further parts of the entire kind of like a pipeline during the facilities, what to do with the assessor. So uh, once we knew um, what kind of defects to expect and how to, what kind of will be returning them to them, then it was, uh, they could design the, the further steps. Right. So it was uh, end to end kind of quite much broader than initially thought, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Right. So basically what I can get from here is that it goes beyond the technical aspect, right? I mean, the modeling is just a small part or the deployment. There has to be that business conversation and um, all of those things. So thank you so much for, for sharing the knowledge. And, you know, speaking of just moving away from the technical side a little bit now, and I assume that there are some, yeah, some internal knowledge or skills that maybe an organization should have or any team should have before kind of thinking about setting up conversion projects. You know, what are those? You know, how should I think about, and I, I will spend quite a reasonable amount of time in the non-technical side. What are those things I should think about when I'm thinking about the metrics, the goals and everything when managing CV projects, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I again will be, will be talking about it from the perspective of a, um, of a kind of like a consultancy company when we mm -hmm, right. want to engage uh, with the, with the uh, clients, you know, as broadly as, as we can also in this business parts, so well, not only on the technical uh, technical side. And I'd say that uh, what, what is necessary there on the, on the client side, this very much depends on the maturity of the, of the clients, because maybe I will start from the easier ones actually. So the easier ones are the ones that they already have some data science teams in place and they kind of like, it's their bread and butter thing to, to work with ML or computer vision like every day, but they just don't really have enough capacity to solve all the challenges. So then, you know, we are there to help. But the more interesting ones are the ones that they don't have the data science teams, or sometimes they don't even have like software developers in the way that they are companies that live in, you know, 21st century. So there's IT, obviously there, there are a lot of um, like systems in place, et cetera, but they, they may not even have software developers that would then take over or maybe that they could, uh, like uh, requalify or, or change their kind of like skills to be to become some you know junior data scientists let's say uh, so these are the most interesting ones and we, we like uh, to work with, with such such clients because then there is a lot of kind of like sharing the knowledge uh, from their work and from our work and then uh, what is needed uh, in such cases is definitely this kind of um, awareness that um, I mean being open that uh, we may not give we may not be able to specify the like how good something will work uh, in the first place because uh, data science is very close to still very close it's somewhere between you know engineering and research and then uh, it's often quite hard to tell in the first place the very precise uh, performance that will be obtained so like being open to uh, solving the the problem together uh, is the key part, and this usually it's not about technical people in the company, but rather in the like with the uh, stakeholders and then I don't know business owners that they will be committed to solve the problem kind of you know together, being open to uh, this this uh, transfer of the of the knowledge information in in, in both ways. Yeah, we have situations where um, the when the business people do not agree with like the technical people. Have you had situations like that? Because of course you mentioned that there has to be transfer of knowledge. What if that that bridge is is it's a common occurrence, right? Where the stakeholders, technical, um, the business stakeholders, do not agree with technical stakeholders. Have you encountered such situations? And you know, how would you advise that technical teams navigate that? I'd say that uh, to be honest, in computer vision, in computer vision uh, projects that that uh, I uh, I try to recall, this wasn't. It wasn't usually the case with like technical approach and that, that this wouldn't be kind of like accepted. Uh, okay, there were there are some there were some cases actually where the business owners seemed to be also quite technical and then uh, um, they would have like their own ideas how to solve things. Uh, and usually you don't really expect uh, like the business owner to um, like impact too much the your kind of like plan for. You know, realization, development of the of the solution. I mean, of course, 
what you expect is rather to guide you through the priorities, uh, you know, like um, being able to answer um, specifics about uh, the, the, the problem, but not necessarily uh, proposing which architecture of which model to use. So therefore, yeah, we, we had some issues with it. And then um, in the end, huh, how to, what can I say? I mean, in the end, it was just like more time consuming for b- both parts to uh, get aligned. Um, and it was like involving, you know, actually, yeah, working on the on those ideas that the client had, uh, plus also pushing with our uh, our ideas whenever the other ones were not really, you know, um, sufficient. But uh, so that was tricky. I'm not sure if I can give you a, a better um, answer to this than just to go into this dialogue with the client and then. Uh, uh, prepare them that if we want to, you know, try also the things that you're proposing, then we should, then we'll definitely spend more time on it. And then, you know, if you're fine with this, then let's do this. All right. So I will be taking over uh, the questions. So next time we'll jump back maybe into a uh, more technical question. So. We have uh, one about a, a baseline, like a modeling approach. So what's your approach for uh, different modalities of classification, detection, and segmentation? Yeah, so uh, these are these are the most, uh, let's say, the most common uh, areas in the computer vision projects, the, the most common kind of like, um, problems to be, to, be, to be answered. And then I'd say that... Uh, um, I wouldn't say there's uh, with respect to this entire approach to the to the computer vision project. I wouldn't say there are major differences between those three. What I mean is, like in the end, um, all those kind of like non ML related things are pretty similar. So, so like you know, talking with the with the client part, working with the team, being sure that they work well together as a, as, as the team then the deliverables part etc what's um, mm, what might be tricky or what's the difference between those uh, those three is probably uh, you know some preprocessing uh, needed the models that are used but also the validation uh, procedures and there um, mm, these are the, the major differences that the data scientists will be you know have to have to deal with um what are what is also different is that um they differ with respect to kind of like how much of the pro- 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 properties of the data what i mean is like if you have images and then uh the task is to do classification then there's quite a, not too much of the like um, information in a given given image you could could you could say you have kind of like a one piece of information per 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 a picture while in segmentation on the other like end like every pixel is actually is giving you some some information because uh you have all of the pixels you know assigned to certain certain classes therefore it's, it's much it, it, it's much more like dense representation much more dense in the information therefore uh, <clears throat> yeah, usually you would need less of those uh, less of data to to tackle the the problem. And actually, what's um, what's quite interesting is that uh, even though sometimes you um, the the client, let's say, says they have this detection problem to be solved or segmentation problem to be solved, it doesn't have to be. What I mean is, this is just uh, maybe I will I will talk about an example when we dealt with a, um, uh, some facial features uh, problem that we had to um, assess some facial features uh, such as, um, you know, kind of like um, how uneven the, 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 the skin was, you know, and you can try to address it in a different way. So you can either present a lot of images of faces where you will have different uh, feature, different like facial features there, like, you know, uneven skin or even extra. But you can also have a much smaller data set when you would just kind of like label the segmentation mask on the areas that are where you have more of, uh, let's say, like uneven 
things like wrinkles or, or maybe some, uh, um, you know, th- th- different kind of like, <laughs> I'm not really expert in this uh, naming, so uh, different kind of like uh, um, not uneven, uneven skin. And then you, you in the end, it's you, you solve pretty much the same problem. In the end, you'll get the same uh, let's say assessment too, but uh, you may approach it from like diff- in different ways, and therefore your requirements for the data, the labeling processes will be completely different. So uh, there's some, there could be some translation between those uh, three different types of products. So yeah, totally makes sense that there's you know different different needs depending on uh, the task. But uh, the next question here is uh, about whether you have some kind of uh, go-to uh, architecture over the years that that has proven to be kind of the most robust for computer vision projects. Do you have such a thing? So uh, I will be frank that I probably kind of like used to have when I was more uh, c- closer to the technical aspects, when I was like uh, rather in technical leader roles, then uh, I was uh, much more closer to shaping the, the solution. And then uh, back then the most popular ones were Back then, when we were to uh, make a make a choice, then depending on the certain requirements, what I mean is, uh, if we had some comp- computational uh, limitations, uh, then there, there was a major kind of like uh, thing to to take into account. So then we would either stick to say yellow for the one that's. Uh, when it doesn't need so many resources or or masker CNN or, or faster CNN, uh, which was uh, usually much more kind of like accurate, but obviously much more uh, heavy to use. Uh, but it was some time ago. Uh, but I, I mean, they're still they're still pretty popular. You, you may you know there are new generations of YOLO, uh, which are still kind of like you know being being updated. Um, and then a faster scene, a masker scene, and they're still they're still used as a framework, but with different backbones. Uh, so they're still still there. Mm, but um, sometimes neither of them was actually working working well, uh, or like well enough for us. So uh, um, I think it's good also to you know experiment with with different architectures, tr- try with. Uh, don't be like shy with trying with different architectures if the problem at hand is kind of like not so, let's say, uh, common. And also to give you some examples, so uh, one of the projects when we actually had to develop our own um, architecture, um, it was also some some time ago, like for I think a bit more than four years ago, we dealt with uh, the images of. Um, like schematics of the chemist, like chemical facility, where there were a lot of pump, pumps, valves, uh, like the pipes between them, etc. Like this schematic would usually look like you would have a a sheet with like few hundred, say two hundred different symbols. Some of them very similar to each other because like the valve, they, we, you could have like five different types of valve, but they wouldn't really, as a symbol, they wouldn't differ too much. Um, and then symbols from pumps, some 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 measurement devices, etc. There were not really uh, a good like network for 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 such things. Like master C, master C, uh, or faster scene in this case would be just like would work with uh, the images where you have several objects, but and rather large, not so small. And we uh, had to come up with a dedicated architecture, with, uh, which I'd say, if we're if we were to be compared with some existing ones, would be some some kind of a feature pyramid uh, network um, plus like full, fully conventional layer. Okay, I don't really want to get too much into 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 details, but uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, sometimes that's you know the only way to go is to is to experiment and be more and be creative. Right, I'm sure it's pretty. Although, <laughs> al- although, although, I'd rather say that uh, it's worth to start with, uh, you know, some existing solutions just for the for the baseline. Uh, definitely faster, uh, more reliable. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Julian in chat. He says, "Hello, I'm curious. Um, 
what role have auto ML models played in computer vision consultant capacity? Do you find them useful? Do they generally perform perform well? To be honest, we don't really use uh, auto ML too often. Actually, in computer vision, almost almost uh, never, because um, major reason is that uh, you would need to have a uh, the infrastructure for this, uh, the infrastructure for like you know trying uh, different models in an automated way, uh, which is just a very expensive thing to to build, and also uh, you know like AutoML task if you want to try, especially in the computer vision area, uh, hundreds of different configurations, then it just uh, prohibitively prohibitively expensive. So we do mm. we do use some AutoML uh, in the consult- consultancy kind of area, but uh, usually this would be in the classical ML when you have to you know play with uh, tabular data, and this is actually pretty cheap to uh, to try hundreds of different uh, configurations models in this automated way. But in computer vision, um, I'd say that you know like the big big names they they have all the all the resources and money to uh, to do this. Uh, but as a moderate consult- consultancy company, we don't really have this uh, this money to burn. So this is so as I said, it's more 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 like uh, a ded- like educated kind of like direction from the beginning, like understanding well the problem at hand, uh, like seeing the understanding what's uh, which architectures are the best to try in the first place. And then obviously playing around with different approaches and architectures, but this is much smaller scale than, you know, AutoML. Oh, yeah. And it's definitely a recurring topic here as well in our circles, like understanding what scale is, you know, appropriate for you and your team to be doing these things at. All right. We have more community questions uh, from LinkedIn Live. So Manish wants to know, any recommended library or module to extract body landmarks on web app? Any thoughts there? Okay, I, as, as I mentioned, I'm not so much, uh, not so close to the technical uh, aspects, uh, but I mean, in general, what we usually would would do or the people in the team would do is uh, when there are, when there are to solve like, issues like this or problem, problems like that, they would do the research first. And then one of the best uh, things to try is Piper Swift code uh, to start with. And then uh, usually there would be, uh, you know, like entire sub page for, for a given problem um, to check with. And there would be, you know, like different benchmarks and also different models to, uh, to try. So I probably won't be able to give you any more than that. Well, I'll still uh, throw another sort of technical or very practical question your way. Uh, Manish also wants to know uh, if you have any way to break down models uh, or modules into chunks so that they can be loaded quickly into browsers. Uh, He says, we break down big JavaScript files into multiple chunks and download them uh, parallelly. (laughs) So this is not only like uh, towards technical and questions, but also quite close to uh, web applications, which is uh, even kind of... um, I mean, I used to. I used to um, be closer to this. Actually, one of the the most challenging projects I have ever led was uh, there was a part of uh, building the web application. Uh, probably a bit different different challenges that we had there, like embedding Unity for like showing three D massive three D point clouds in the web browser. You know, like I, I cannot really help with this kind of uh, with this particular question. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, all good. I mean, yeah, people, <laughs> people, of course, have burning practical questions on their mind, and you know, you can always get lucky if you <laughs> throw them around. <laughs> Maybe somebody from so. the audience knows the answer or can help, and then I can absolutely, reach out, I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and if anyone has uh, any ideas, you're more than welcome to participate in our chat and share your experience and and your ideas. So thank you, Julian and Manish, for your questions. Um, Remigius wants to know a bit more about like your project uh, process. Um, like, how many milestones would you typically have in in such a process? Uh, okay, milestones is like one 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 part of the of this entire picture. What I mean is, um, 
uh, when when like when discussing this uh, like how to deal with the computer vision projects and in general machine learning projects, uh, I uh, personally like a lot the the crisp um, DM uh, workflow or kind of like a yeah workflow let's say. Uh, or methodology, uh, which is one of the most popular in the in the RIA. Uh, it's a bit uh, like it, it was one of the first ones, and then uh, some of things are not really fully captured by by this uh, uh, by this methodology. But there's there's no way uh, golden grails. So you know, like a lot of them, different ones. Which currently there there would be already several different uh, like uh, different methodologies. Mm, they will they in the end they wouldn't really differ too much from each other. What I mean is like, what's the core thing in the machine learning project is the like iterative process of, 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 of solving um, the, the, the problem. And coming back to the milestones, one of the first milestones that uh, I'd say I would have there uh, is uh, if we don't have the data before starting the project, like to to have the data in place, the data set in place. So this is one of the core things to have. So um, we we like to have the data set in place before starting. Sometimes it's not really possible. Sometimes it's just it's just the data is being kind of collected on the way, or only once we talked more with the with the client, we understand better. They understand better what's needed, and then uh, they would. Um, they would uh, give us more more of a, more of the data needed. But the, the first thing is to the, the first milestone would be to to have the let's say operational data set something you could you could start with, and usually this should be pretty early on in the in the project. Then the the, the further milestone is something that uh, I I would call like a skeleton of the solution. So uh, when managing the, the the ML projects, also computer vision ones, um, what I think is the most important is to have the like minimal but working like end to end solution. In the first place, what I mean, something that would uh, would use the data, even if if it's a small data set or just just part of the data set you, you're going to to have, you, you you will be able to load it to do some minimalistic preprocessing or like anything that's needed just to to be able to to run the models, train the the, the first models. Uh, actually, you don't even have to have the models in the first place. You you, you may use some some heuristics or some constant models, something that you don't even need to train uh, for this first kind of uh, end-to-end uh, solution. Then the validation procedure and then a computation of the of the metrics, so the evaluation uh, evaluation step. Uh, and once you have it, uh, then probably some, um, like the, the end the deliverables, you probably would need to return what you found there in some in some format, some JSON or some kind of like visualization. So also this this piece. Once you have this end-to-end solution place, even if it's like really basic, you would already have something to build upon. And also, and this serves multiple multiple purposes. Uh, one is that uh, you can kind of like now it the, the 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 problem can be split into pieces and people can work in parallel on different aspects so one one person can work on the data side prepare more more data the other c- could start with uh, more elaborate validation procedures or, or or the model it gets more kind of like uh, even more like let's say pa- parallel the the further you are in the in the development um and the other thing is that you build this uh you start to monitor the, the results and you'll have the first benchmarks to compare with. So it's it's never, it's, it's actually very hard to say, let's say you get at some point 90% performance of something, you know, F1, let's say. You, you can't even say if it's good or, or, or bad if you don't really know what would be some, you know, baseline score of random guessing or some, you know, some heuristic, simple heuristic. Once you, you have them, you only then you can kind of like assess the performance, um, and then so so the milestone. So the second milestone would be to have the skeleton, yes. And then uh, the, the the remaining milestones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's kind of like I think very project specific. So depending on um, if it's like closer to the users, uh, you would expect some user feedback at some point. Another milestone would be to have MVP that could be shown to some users to play with. You know, if it's more about um, yeah, being part of some web application, where would you have it uh, 
in the way that you can kind of like build some you know backend uh, over on on this and then uh, and then serve through some API to to this you know uh, front end up. I mean, then it's then it depends, but for sure those those first two are the the major ones. Most most important. Oh yeah, that was certainly some good milestone detail right there. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, uh, Remigius, for the question. So, Stephen, back to you. If we have you on the line. Hey, sure. Um, hell, thank you so much for for that. Um, I'm sort of wondering because obviously. Uh, when Sabine read your profile earlier on and uh, the numerous works you've done as well, uh, quite expiry. But I wanted to know, uh, do you have your, say, what we call the biggest failures you've had over over the long time working on computer vision related projects that you'd love to share? Maybe it seems you know about and, you know, maybe you are even overcome them. You were breaking a bit, but I think, uh, yeah, it was only towards the end. Uh, so I think okay. I'll be able to to answer. Um, uh, okay, the the failures. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure, there were there were many uh, many failures. Um, <laughs> so, like, okay, I mean, what, some of them were one of the failures that. So I have like different ones. Let's say one of them is when we actually didn't even start the project. The failure was in the first place that we uh, just didn't were not able to. Come to the same terms with the with the with the client. So the client was like a very, let's say, they were very far far from the IT area. So they were like manufacturer of some plastic packets. I, I'm not even you know kind of like sure what they wanted to have was a kind of like AI based monitoring solution place to um, like observe like if people are not entering the areas where they shouldn't go because there's some you know kind of like heavy duty machines working or some other cases like if the um, trash bins for like specialized trash bins for some like plastic stuff or, or some metal um, remainings if they're kind of like getting full because then they could uh, you know kind of like schedule to to, to uh, empty them so like different aspects uh, and in general uh, th- those things wouldn't be too hard to do for from the ml perspective but uh, the client was kind of like treating us as a uh, yet one another where the v- vendor of some uh, like they were treating us in the same way the way they would treat uh, let's say a company that would just uh, put some mm, new like reorganize their they they workplace like put some uh walls extra walls there or or some like a uh, installer of some extra lightning you know it's kind of like they were requesting very stiff timelines uh with no way for like uh buffers uh, they were like very strict with uh um us defining the the performance like you know like the requirements etc and we discussed with them for a few weeks, even went there to the to the to this place, and in the end, we just kind of like we just couldn't start it. You know, like uh, the differences differences between the the language we use and also the the way the expectations were just too too big to even start. So that's one of the failures because uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, invested in in you know in started the project. In the end, it was just uh, we didn't start. Uh, and I have also another one, which is kind of, uh, it's it's a failure, but it's also a success to some to some extent. What I mean is a very complicated project we've, we've done for, I think, like 10 months or something, uh, which in the end just turned out to be not so kind of successful. What I mean is uh, it was a very big team working on the project. It was like a... a project involving ML aspects, but also a lot of different things like front-end UX UI, building the entire solution back. And in the end, um, it turns out that uh, at least we, but I believe like nowadays technology is not really able to solve uh, this particular uh, task. Uh, It was kind of, we were always almost there, but have never reached it. 
And then, uh, mm, yeah, it was failure in the end that in the end, you know, we didn't really, we didn't really solve it. And a lot of money went there, you know, um, so uh, yeah, quite a failure. Although the good things are that we actually still working with this client. They figured out that, okay, it wasn't possible really to solve it with the existing technology, but they still believed in us that we kind of made whatever we could to do this. And we still cooperate together um, for a few years already. So in the end, success also. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, we definitely love war stories in this podcast because these are sort of lessons from the trenches. We reckon that teams can definitely take uh, as a second lessons. And uh, I think you mentioned something about um, computer, computer vision projects being easier to manage earlier on. And I would love to know, in your opinion, uh, what's like the difference between managing a computer vision project um, as well as say, uh, another, any other unstructured project or maybe not unstructured, any other ML project like NLP or all those other projects. What's, what are those differences you would love to share? Actually, like each, each one of those, like computer vision, NLP and, and like, let's say, some tabular, let's say, database projects, uh, they, they would be different and they would have their own difficulties. So starting with the tabular ones, when you speak about like rather classical machine learning, when uh, also part of the task is to build the features. The tricky part there is usually that uh, it's rarely the case that you have one place where the data is stored and it's it's kind of like in a... Um, in a kind of like a good shape already. What I mean is uh, usually, especially when you deal with uh, not so much like major and technical clients, which are just kind of like getting into AI, they would like to see if AI can help, or help. <clears throat> they might not be even, they might not be in the uh, major enough to even have like one data lake or, or one you know source of the data it's usually the difficulty is to being able to to get access to multiple sources of data combining them together uh looking for i mean learning where all this data that might be uh, useful is and how to combine it this usually is very hard, hard to assess how how much time this will take and this is one of the difficulties and you can't also assess kind of like how how much information there is in the, in the data so, you know, unless this is a very kind of like a simpler problem when you have, uh, when you can just use one table and everything is there, then then this is the tricky, tricky, tricky part of, of those projects. With NLP, uh, the problem would be usually the, the data. What I mean is, um, like when comparing to computer vision, um, you would have quite often some open source data sets that are at least similar to, to what you do. What I mean is you may want to do defect detection on, on the tires and there might not be like this particular data set there, but there might be some defect detection on, I don't know, like a steel sheet or some carbon fiber sheet, or, you know, something that in the end will be quite similar. You can reuse quite a lot of existing neural nets or, you know, portraying on some existing data and therefore the need for, for data is uh, much, much smaller. You, you don't really have to have too much to already produce something useful for, for the client. With NLP, uh, that's also kind of like the case that uh, for most of the time, transfer learning is used and then uh, some kind of like generic purpose models are used to be to, to answer um, the, the specific needs of the client. But uh, unless these are not like some generic so, so there might, what I mean is like, in, you won't really find so useful, very similar NLP data sets, let's say in the open source. This is one thing. The other thing is if you want to produce those data sets, this is uh, not so easy to, to generate automatically. With, with images, you can, it's, let's say, kind of like quite, let's say with OCR problems, there's plenty of artificially uh, generated uh, kind of like uh, images for the OCR training purposes. With NLP, that's not really so easy. I mean, you can use some existing uh, generative models like, you know, GPT, etc. cetera. But uh, in the end, what you do is kind of like you, you train the model to not really deal with the real data, realistic data, but kind of like reverse engineer the GPT or, you know, like what you can get is something that in the end won't really work well 
on the, on the clients on the real life data. Yeah, so the data is 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 is, is usually the problem in the other ones. Computer perfect. vision, uh, yeah, it's easier. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for for answering that here. And uh, let, let's let's dig deeper into the the data aspect a little bit. I, I would love to know: Have you sort of encountered the situation whereby because with computer vision projects, I think one of the things is that it could get like really compute intensive, right? You're dealing with like uh, a lot of maybe you're dealing with high resolution data sets, and then you have to like use a distributed uh, um, architecture to sort of process the entire thing, or maybe the model you're training as well. Have you encountered a situation whereby you're managing this project, the compute costs get out of budgets, right? It's not something you budgeted for. You know, have you encountered that sort of situation and encountered sorry that sort of situation and sort of navigated that path with your team, sort of? So I'd say that this would be, this is something that you could assess already in the early stages of the of the project. Now, when discussing with a client, this kind of like a scale needed to, um, like the computational power needed to, to to deal with the scale that's in in place. And we usually would say, like, if it's kind of like relatively small project. Uh, like you know, tens of thousands images to be processed. This is something that uh, uh, you can. We have our own kind of like certain farm, so so we can we can we can use it, or we can just uh, uh, do it in the in the cloud. But just kind of like you know, uh, having a few VMs to to, to do the job. Uh, but if um, if you see that there will be a need for a very computational heavy uh, projects, usually we kind of like already in the deal. So secure it. So usually we prefer that uh, it's done on the client side. So uh, in the clients, you know, cloud or, or on their accounts. So the computational right. costs are kind of there. There's no. We don't really have to um, reinvoice or, or like deal with it. It's, it's it's already there on the on the client side. So that's that's how we usually would try to to solve it, and then. Uh, I just recall that uh, we had some 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 projects where uh, uh, the computational budget was kind of like, especially and if you work in the cloud and you're not so and this is not particularly com maybe computer vision uh, case, but uh, let's say if you if you work with um, a feature engineering on, on some use some BigQuery uh, queries <laughs> or infrastructure, it can get very costly if you're not really so. Uh, uh, you know, um, yeah, if, if it's not like well designed. So uh, we had certain situations, let's say, when the, uh, it was pretty, pretty costly. But yeah, mm -hmm. in computer vision, it's more controllable because you don't really have this kind of like a complex interactions of uh, like, you know, different uh, computationally heavy operations, I'd say. I mean, once you know which model you use, you already kind of like have the and times the the amount of data you're already able to assess the the cost pretty well. Awesome, thank you for for answering that, Michal. And I, I think I would go more to this particular question, which is a a lot more scenario based, right? And uh, say you get hired to clean up a computer vision model, a computer vision project that has been, maybe the team has worked on it before and it's a bit messed up right now. You have like 90 days. What do you do first? You get into a team, they've started working on this particular CV project and then, you know, it's stalled somehow, you know, but you get, they hire you as a consultant, of course, to come and clean up the project. What do you do in the first 90 days? Mm -hmm, I see, I see, yeah. 90 days is actually not not, uh, not too little. What I mean is like uh, yeah, we, we, when we work with, uh, with the projects, uh, quite often we, we, we like to split them into kind of like three months periods, which is roughly 90 days. But as you have mentioned this, uh, let's say existing some legacy, like legacy project, I probably would uh, first to like try to understand where, where, where the issue is. Like if it's... Uh, let's say the maintenance issue or the performance issue or some uh, issue with um, like data, data stream that's needed to, I mean, you would address it uh, in a completely different way depending on what's the problem. If let's say the performance is the issue, then the first thing would be to actually look at the results, look what the network produces or the solution produces 
and then kind of like try try to iterate, trace it back to like looking at the architecture and how it's built to see you know where the the problem might be. But if uh, if the problem is let's say with the maintenance, because you see that uh, it's just like a spaghetti code and it's very hard to uh, even like you know introduce any changes, um, then uh, hmm. Yeah, it might be it might be the case that in ninety days you're able to build uh, a new solution, cleaner one than 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 try to revive the existing one. Uh, Interesting. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, yeah, ninety days is actually quite a lot of time. If the uh, yeah, for for kind of like computer vision process that I'm kind of like used to, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Thank you so much for for sharing that, and I think we're going in, into like the the final force you're wrapping up, and uh, this is like the time for lessons, <laughs> the the lessons you've learned and so forth. But uh, do you have maybe any lessons you've learned from projects over time that you think like very small, reasonable scale teams can sort of take on and incorporate to their like computer vision projects, man managing the end to end process for it? Yeah. So uh, if I were to if I were to kind of like look look back into let's say my early days of how I, how I was approaching the, the the projects, you know there was this kind of like eagerness uh, and then uh, this 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 need to uh, have the solution or the results like fast, you know, like uh, hack some some solution use like the, the network that you love the most or, or something fancy in the first place and try to kind of like a bring the uh, some results uh, very quickly and this is something that we would definitely avoid uh, now uh, having like been there or, or, or led uh, um, many many projects what i mean is like definitely build the, the issue you would have if, if you just approach this, maybe you will have some very good, very nice results in the after, let's say, the first week. But then you have a solution that is not really, you have to rebuild anyway. You, you can't really build up on it. You just have to you know, put it into trash and start seriously. You know, uh, the other thing is when working with a client, then you'll have some very good results after the first week. But then the feeling that the project kind of like stalled because, uh, it's quite easy to get some initially good results in the first place, but then once you get the details, when you try to uh, improve them, then it gets tricky. Then usually there's this feeling that it's kind of like stagnated. So definitely, I would uh, rather prefer to build uh, like most possibly basic solution in the first place, but right. end to end, you know, and then like iteratively improve it. Also observing this iterative process of improvement, like. And, and and seeing that it's not so kind of like easy and straightforward, this is something that uh, you have time for thought process necessary for the data scientist to kind of like understand the problem better and also mm -hmm. you know build some stable solution. But also for the client to kind of like you know um, you see that it's not such an you know AI kind of like easy thing to do. Well, I mean it's like it. It's actually a process, you know? It's not just you will take this AI brick, put it there, and it will magically work. There's no there's no magic. It's just, uh, you know, hard work, time, engineering, yeah. Awesome. And I, I think it's going to be good to end on a note of people management, and that's our final note. And, you know, do you have a special way you sort of structure the particular teams that work on these sort of projects, maybe like, for example, you have a research-based uh, computer vision engineer who's working on like the model development stuff. Do you need to have like a separate, say, office engineer doing the deployment side or how do you typically structure a team for a computer vision project? Yeah, so again, it depends on uh, what what in the end is is to be delivered. Like if it's just a POC, then just data scientists would, would probably be, be, be enough. Although, it's worth to have in mind that you know this they should be team players uh, but like if it's also the goal is to to deliver certain solution deploy it um, productize it uh, what what we do quite often or usually and what, what i like a lot is that uh, to have a interdisciplinary team pretty much as soon as it's possible what i mean is uh, when data scientists are working hand in hand with uh, software engineers or, or MLOps engineers that would then take over or, or uh, wrap up the, the, the solution, 
it's kind of like I mean, usually the case is that it's not that you have a certain point in time when you when the ML ML part of, of work is done and then can be productized product, productized. Usually it's kind of like a smooth thing when the already the improvements are so so are kind of like small and it can be already like deployed, uh, you know, but it's still, there's still a work in, let's say, work in progress phase. Uh, and then uh, when the these people are working hand in hand, they learn like what are the, you know, challenges, the requirements on in, on both kind of like ends um, of, 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 of these projects. And this is very beneficial. And it's also quite, people like it because then they are also exposed to some you know, challenges or problems that are not so much accustomed with. So, uh, so this is something that uh, we like to do. If we can squeeze in uh, a quick uh, audience question before we wrap up, uh, Gabriel would like to know uh, any thoughts on computer vision data management? It seems more complex than regular tabular data. Any closing thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'd say that it's. Uh, I, I mean, as I kind of like explained uh, at some point, uh, to me, it's just, uh, I wouldn't say it's much more complex. Uh, it's just a different way, a different approach, uh, probably even easier in the way that we can, as people, we can assess like the, how the models work. It's much easier to debug, I'd say. It's much, much easier to kind of like um, see where the problem lies and then how to, how to, how to address them. So I'd say that uh, I would say they're even easier. Obviously, different technologies are used. What I mean is, like, for most of the yeah. time, deep learning. So, different skills. Uh, yeah, but um, otherwise, uh, at least for, for for me, it's it's, it's kind of like easier to manage those. Mm -hmm. Steven, anything? Uh, any any last words, <laughs> so to speak? We have still some questions, but now we really I have didn't to prioritize. Get the, the question. It was data management. Sorry, not the, like the project management. Now, yeah. uh, now I see it. Ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, um, it's just probably what's 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 more tricky is the size. Uh, so that it's just they are much heavier. So, um, um, if you can have, if you can do some like the duplication in the first place or or sampling. Then definitely is something that uh, it's it's worth to to do. To be honest, we usually have the problem with like two small data sets, not too large. Uh, in the <laughs> like, yeah, the problems we we've deal with, we we've deal with. But in the ones where there's uh, a lot of data, um, usually there's you don't really need to process all of all of them. Like uh, usually, this is more about. Uh, picking the for some active learning or for some uh, I don't know like um, knowing where the data comes from and knowing the metadata to 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 focus on the data that that that, that is the most that are the most kind of relevant to 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 start with. So I think it is time for us to wrap things up for today. Uh, it, the hour went by really fast. Um, Thank you so much, Michal. <laughs> it was great to have you and have you share your broad experience and project management expertise with us, even some of those juicy failure stories. Although it was a little bit cheating because it was a success in disguise, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, the end, we... although I, I didn't know it at, uh, you know, at the end of the project that the client will come back actually. So, you know, <laughs> it was, <laughs> back end. then it was uh, quite a sweaty time. Oh, I'm sure. But, you know, to your credit, it it uh, ended well. <laughs> All right. So before we close things, um, can people follow what you're doing anywhere online or, or connect with you? Yes, definitely on, on LinkedIn. Just say yeah, my name, surname, and then Deep Sensei I should be enough to, to find me. Makes perfect sense. All right. Thank you again. And thanks to the audience for asking uh questions so we'll be back in two weeks as always next time is uh next episode is july 6th and we will have then with us mateus opala and we will be discussing leveraging unlabeled image data with self self-supervised learning or pseudo labeling 
<clears throat> so that will be uh, something to attend. Yeah, something to attend for sure. So we'll see you then and we'll see you on socials and in the MLOps community Slack where you can always ask questions in advance or after episodes. If you cannot make it, uh, you can talk to us about anything MLOps related there. And you can, of course, also catch up with previous episodes on Apple Podcasts uh, or Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. So until next time, thanks everybody and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. We run it every other Wednesday and you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcast. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time.